Um, there are, and I'll try and be terse, there are 16 and a half million children in poverty in the United States and the wealthiest country in the history of the world. Um, there's a drug war and a mass incarceration that has left millions of children in the impoverished neighborhoods of the United States growing up fatherless um, in a situation that ensures generational poverty. There are millions of families that go bankrupt because they cannot afford the health care they desperately need. There are entire species going extinct and ecosystems being demolished. There are citizens in six or more countries in the world being incinerated by American bombs. And um, there is a class at the very top of the American social stratus that actively works for these things to happen because it makes them even richer than they already are, which is quite rich. Can you imagine rooting for rape and torture and starvation and misery? That's what 1% of this country does. Um, there's a, so there's a system that incentivizes them to work for the subordination and <coughs> suffering of other people. Um, Milton Friedman, the sort of father of modern free market capitalism in 1970, wrote that the social responsibility of corporations is to increase their profits. Uh, that is the only thing that corporations are legally allowed to do, is to try and increase the, the money that they give to their shareholders. That's it. They, they are not allowed to have any other, by law, by bylaw and written statute, they're not allowed to have any other um, commitments. Um, and in the United States, there's this mysterious doctrine of corporate personhood, where corporations are considered people, like you and me, even though they haven't got lungs and skin like normal people have, um, and, like they, and they haven't got other social commitments like other people have. Um, and so they're entitled to the same free speech rights as you and I. Um, also in the United States, there's this mysterious idea that political donation, money, right, counts as free speech. So corporations, which have huge amounts of money, in fact, are allowed to focus on nothing other than accumulating huge amounts of money, are allowed to spend infinite amounts of it on the political system. Um, and in that way, uh, th th and, and so that system inevitably leads to corporate control of what should be a democratic politics. Right, where people are disenfranchised and have very little control over the system, and corporations have huge amounts of control over the system. Um, and there is only one cure for this, um, and the cure is not electing good people to run things. That is not the cure. The cure is making the people who run things afraid of us. That's absolutely critical. Uh, the, the only times when any liberty and justice and equality have been expanded in the United States have been the times when people have made the people in charge afraid of us. Uh, Roosevelt did not run on the New Deal, and Johnson did not run on the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act. Uh, was, there was people in the street forcing their hands that made that happen. Uh, however good a person we might have in the White House, uh, that person is vastly more terrified of Wall Street than he is of us. And if we're going to change anything, we've got to reverse those priorities. Um, and what that's going to require is constant, sustained hostility to power. Um, the, the people of the United States, using our hiring and firing power, right, of our public officials, we can hire and fire them through voting, using that threat to extort them for justice and equality, the free. We have to get them to bribe us with justice and equality and freedom, because they're afraid that we're going to fire them. That is the goal. And that is the project that the Occupy movement is about. Creating a huge amount of activity and mobilization all across the country and indeed all across the world to make the people in power apprehensive about doing the will of the 1% who work, as I say, actively for all of the worst things you can imagine. Um, uh, th this movement comes from a sense of political disillusionment, right? Uh, in 2008, our generation was very excited about a political movement to elect a candidate. And that candidate got in office and immediately <laughs> appointed Larry Summers and Tim Geithner to run his economic policies and um, you know, Hillary Clinton and Robert Gates to run his foreign policy and, and, and greatly disappointed the many people who were so excited about um, his election because those people were duped into thinking that electing someone constituted a movement. 
And now, three years on, when income disparities are becoming even greater, and we're seeing ever more legislation catering to um, you know, expanding corporate wealth, um, our generation primarily, and also now others, have discovered that that is not what a movement is, electing someone. That a movement is holding that, those people that we elect accountable. Um, and that, that's what we're doing right now. Um, this requires both revolution, if I may, and solidarity, if I may. Um, the, the, the revolution is this, what's happening right now. It's difficult to imagine what a revolution would be if it weren't thousands of people protesting every day and every night in every major city in the United States. Nonviolently, defiantly, and in a united way, in solidarity with one another. They, you, one can't imagine what a revolution would look like in the United States except for that. And that's the situation that we find ourselves in right now. So that's one way that it happens. Um, and solidarity is another way that it happens. Um, the, the way that Occupy Wall Street has organized itself is as a direct democracy, um, where every policy, every expenditure of $100, every statement that goes out has to be decided by the General Assembly, which is anybody who shows up, by a nine-tenths consensus. It's a completely transparent um, situation. And everybody at Occupy Wall Street in Liberty Plaza Park has free food, free health care, free comfort, free, you know, all of the, there's a library, there, everything that you can imagine. So the living situation is the demand. We don't have a manifesto, we don't have a, a five point list of demands. The living situation is the demand. Complete people power, complete democracy, um, no catering to wealth, no one considered a spokesman, no one considered a chairman, no one considered a leader at all. Complete equality. That is the demand. Um, and so to that end, we, we call ourselves the 99%. That does not mean that 99% of people agree with us. Quite clearly that's not the case. Although 54% do. <laughs> which is thrilling. <laughs> because a month ago it was like 30 of us emailing each other too much. And now 54% of America likes what we're doing. Um, the 99% doesn't refer to like-minded people. The 99% refers to everyone who's getting steamrolled by the 1%, right? The Tea Party who hate us, they're part of the 99% and we stand in solidarity with them because they're getting fired left and right. The policemen who brutalize us and, and mace us, we stand with them because their public workers and austerity budgets mean that their pensions are threatened too. They're part of the 99%, yes? The people who disagree with us, the people who beat us, they're part of the 99%, and they might not stand with us, but we stand with them. That's critical to this idea. Okay. Um, and uh, luckily, we're not alone. Uh, in 2011 alone, we've seen Tunisia, Egypt, Spain, France, England, Greece, Madison, Wisconsin, Chile, uh, all over the place, rise up, and, and appreciate this distinction, that it's not about uh, the right versus the left, and it's not about gender queer versus squares, and it's not about um, Muslims versus Christians, it's about democracy, right, demos, people power, versus plutocracy, wealth power. It's about 99% trying to extricate our democratic politics from the 1% who control it for their own means. That is the dichotomy that is at play here, and that's the one that we need to be focusing on, and that is the linking feature between all of the revolutionary movements that have happened this year, which I, I, I'm sort of eager for December, because then all of the retrospectives about this year will be coming out in Time and Newsweek and the New York Times, and everybody will be talking about all of the awesome shit that happened this year. <laughs> um, so yes, 2011 is a year of democratic attempts to abolish plutocracy, and I'm so glad to see that you guys are all ready to join us in those attempts. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm around for a little while, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have about what's going on by Wall Street. Woo!